Hello? I don't, I don't think this is on yet. I'll go tell him. Oh, now it's on. Hello? Is that? I usually get powered up during the pledge. It's no pledge. There we go. I'll uh, call to order uh, this meeting of a uh, committee of the whole of the Village Board of Trustees for Thursday, November 3, with um, appearances from members of the uh, Finance Commission as well. Uh, Chris, do you want to take roll? Sure. Um, Chairman Pascuma? Here. Trustee Harlow? Here. Trustee Fisher? Here. Trustee Burns? Here. Trustee Banky? Here. Chairman um, Waldo? Uh, present by phone. And um, Commissioner Diarco. Here. Thank you. So we're going to talk tonight about uh, some of the components of our 2023 budget, um, the uh, some of the revenue assumptions that were used going into the budget. Uh, we had a um, small gathering of uh, Adam Waldo and Chris Elder and myself, along with village staff, uh, who worked on some of those uh, revenue assumptions. We're going to go through those. Then we're gonna go through the uh, proposed uh, capital improvement plan and master infrastructure plan and uh, finish up with an overview of the uh, 2023 budget. And uh, Kathleen, are you gonna present on the revenue assumptions or? Um, we're going to have Allison, but I, I will assist her as needed. Very good. Okay. Allison, you wanna take it so, away? So I do wanna make um, an introduction or two, just in case um, everyone uh, doesn't recognize all the faces. Um, Allison Broden, who was the assistant finance director, is now the village's finance director. Um, additionally, uh, Andre Peterson joined our staff uh, this summer, and she is the assistant village manager. She will be replacing Brad. She was very instrumental in helping prepare for tonight, as was Allison, of course. And Matthew Liu is now our engineer. He hired to replace a retiring Dan Dieter. And um, also we have Michael Hayes, who is our new um, uh, Parks and Rec superintendent. So we have some new faces here. Um, and I just wanted you to know who everyone was before we started. And with that, we have uh, PowerPoint presentations for all of these presentations. So you can follow along. And as usual, just feel free to ask have at the time. So with that, Allison. Hello. Um, we're going to go through these slides and um, kind of go over the revenue assumptions that we would like to um, go forward into the proposed budget for 2023. These were discussed, as um, Trustee Pachma said, with some of the finance um, commission members as well as um, Matt. So we will start. With. This is uh, just a quick overview of 2022. Um, so the village began 2022 with a general fund reserve of $6,391,093. The projected general fund reserve at the end of 2022 is $5,911,965, which is 29.7% of operating expenditures, which is well above the uh, policy of 25%. Um, and then the total general fund reserve, including the CIP reserve, is projected to be at 43.23% at the end of 2022. So this is a snapshot of what we call um, our schedule two or three that you will see um, in the budget. Um, again, this is a draft right now. Um, so I will, um, as you can see, we're, we're talking about estimated actuals for um, revenues to be 23,576,822. Our total operating expenditures are 19,921,750. Um, to have an excess of 3.6 million. Um, what I did want to go over um, down below is the um, we're including a contingent, there's a contingency of 350,000 that was in the budget 
for 2022. There's the CARES Act ARPA money. We received in mid-September the second tranche of the 1.2, so we have a total of 2.4 now, um, of the ARPA funds. And we're gonna transfer that second tranche to the MIP. Um, and then the other thing I want to point out is the transfer of the capital reserve. Um, we budgeted 1.2 250. <coughs> we're going to increase that to 2 million. And our um, thoughts on that were that um, we have an over, not an overabundance, but um, our revenues outperformed what we thought it was going to be. So again, this is proposed. Um, and then the general fund transfer to the MIP. Um, historically, it was at 1.72. 1 um, in the past, we've, we upped it in 21 to 1 1.9. Um, and so for 2022 estimated actuals, we're looking to reduce it back down to the 1.7 because of the revenues in the MIP outperforming. The non-home real sales tax is outperforming by about $600,000. $600,000, yes. I, I just want to clarify the capital transfer. Um, we have been fortunate that the revenues have outperformed, but as you've seen in the capital plan, the expenses have gone up, and therefore, because we have additional revenues this year, we feel that we should make a higher than anticipated transfer to the capital project fund. And then moving forward, we have a higher dollar amount than previously um, attached. It was 1.2, and we're recommending it go up to 1.4. And Allison, uh, how many years did we uh, cut the um, capital improvement reserve transfer? Was it we, we did set we did 625? We did 625 in 2020 and 2021. Right. So we, so even. We're, we're increasing it this year by 750, but that still doesn't even make up for the shortfall completely that we had from Correct. from having the amounts in, in 20 and 21. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, and if you look at the bottom, um, the uh, for 2022 estimated actuals, we're expecting to be at 29.7%, once again, which is well above the 25% policy. I was at a, a quick question. Uh, in the past when we've had excess we've um looked to also pay down the pension or you know fund the, uh, the pension liabilities do we feel like uh we're in a uh, the levels that we have today are uh, at acceptable levels and we don't need to do that at this point um i i would think that that would be a board decision on how on how you want to handle that i can't make that decision yeah, no, I'm just curious if, I mean, I, I'm not saying we do do that. I'm just wondering. In the past, we've, we've done that, and it sounds like we, we, we're not going to do that now. Uh, so just want to make sure that there isn't a need to, you know, put any excess to the, the pension like we used to in the past. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously paying what's statutorily required. The transfer here, obviously, it's still the village's money. We're just putting it in a different bucket and indicating that we want it to go towards capital expenditures, but it's still money that the village has. Obviously, if you make an extra payment to the pension plan, we can't get that money back. Yeah, and, yeah. And, so it, and, it sounds like we don't, you don't feel like we need to do that at this point. It's better to allocate it to capital because we've been uh, taking money away from capital for other things over the past years. Um, so it seems like that's sort of where we're coming up. Yeah. Right. And we're, we're mindful of that we have made those types of transfers before. Um, the draft operating budget anticipates what the actuary recommends. In the event that we were to be losing traction um, on the improvements, I think one, they're 77. Um, they're higher than where we were before. We would certainly look at that, but I think it's best in the context of next year as opposed to the, this year. Makes sense. On this page is basically a summary of all of the major revenue sources that we discussed with the finance subcommittee. Um, this page includes the first column is 2023, 2023 um, bonus for next year's budget. Include, the second column is what's um, projected for 2022. And then you have 2022 budget, and then you have the last four years act. Is, is a source 
uh, information so you can see for the last 10 years um, where we were on all of these funds, um, all these revenue sources. Um, and at the bottom, we also have a three year, a five year, and a 10 year average for each one. And we did help you use this to help form um, the proposed numbers. Um, this is this is the uh, form that we used when we um, met with the finance subcommittee. Um, I'm going to go into detail into each one of the um, revenue sources. A uh, quick question. Sure. So uh, places for eating. Yes. So I see that going down for, for 2023 over the projection. Is that, I'm just wondering what. Is that you know revenue from a um, restaurant sales tax? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's a um, extra um, places for eating tax that is applied to those places where people have sit down uh, or carry out um, uh, some food, and the discussion was concerns about a recessionary impact on people's behavior. So there was an adjustment made to that in anticipation of a recession. Most of um, when when the numbers are, have been reduced, it was factored. Um, there was a concern of the subcommittee and of staff as well, uh, that there is a potential um, adverse impact of a recession, and certainly places for eating, um, the non-home rule sales tax, some of the sales tax, all of those things would definitely be impacted by changes. Okay. In, in to be clear. The amount that we're projecting is actually higher than what was budgeted for 2022. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just that the revenue, yes. uh, uh, the, the 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 projected revenue is for for uh, so 2022 is actually greater so, than what was estimated. Yeah, yeah. I'm just kind of thinking in terms of our our big outdoor dining, you know, experiment and promotion, and everything like that. You know, would we see more it's of an really the outdoor well, yeah, well, it's helped, but I mean, back with 413,000 back in 2021, and there was a, a pandemic going on. So maybe that was all takeout. I think it's still the same tax. Yeah. Yeah. But we're, we're saying 425. Okay. Well, I'm just, right. I'm well, just commenting. We're estimating 453. <coughs> so going down to 425. So there's two right, right, right. 2022, we're projecting 450. Yes. Yeah, so, right. so you are seeing the uptick when you see the estimated column. 2022 is what we think we're going to end the year with. Okay. So that's certainly an increase from budget. Then we added a column which goes budget um, to the subcommittee proposed. But we also wanted to look at the estimated actual because certainly there's some areas where the estimated actual is very, very high and we wanted to just make sure and, and it's because that's just what's happening right now. And we just wanted to make sure that we were factoring both of these components when we estimated what we thought uh, the upcoming year would be. Because it's a little bit different, difficult. Um, it's, it's a weird time. You have inflation. We're going into a recession. And th this is just a really difficult time to try and target behavior. Also, go back to the previous one. In some of these categories, like when you're when you're seeing the sales tax and use tax, there's both in sales tax the pent up um, demand that uh, from being locked down in 2020, so you're seeing it uh, increase in 2021 and 2022. But then on top of it, there were legislative changes that moved some of the money from the use tax to the sales tax. So it isn't just one variable this time impacting these numbers. They're multi variables. And we're really just trying to come up with the most conservative. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, if everything works and it's conservative, sure. That's, correct, yeah. correct. And yeah. so um, we, we, of course, we, because we would rather err, err on the side of being conservative and have our budget match and that all work out as opposed to um, overestimating the revenues. That leads to a bad or right. a I'm used to the corporate world where we're always overestimating revenues, or, or we're told to. For a serious organization. Huh? For a serious organization. And depending on your time to it, I wouldn't know about that. The apps are okay, first one we're going to talk about is income tax. 
Um, as you know, income tax revenue is a per capita based distribution, the local government distribution fund. This is based on income tax collection statewide and distributed based on population. Um, it came in very high this year, um, more than we expected. Um, our estimate for this year is 2.6, and we, yet we budgeted um, 1.9. So for um, next year, we are going to um, propose 2.4 million. Um, so the revenue assumption for 2023 income tax is set at a decline of 4% based on the information received from the Illinois Municipal League as compared to 2022. Um, and then we also adjusted it further due to the potential impact a recession might have. Um, we also um, are mindful of um, large corporations that are le leaving Illinois, so we will keep an eye on this just to and keep you updated if there are major changes. Any questions, comments on the income tax? Okay. Next one we're going to do is um, sales and use tax. Um, if you remember, um, state sales tax consists of a one point of sale based tax. Um, in addition, the, re the village receives a per capita share of the state use tax. Um, sales tax revenue has, as you remember last year, has benefited from the level of taxes most online sales at the point of sale. Um, Non-home rule sales tax is a referendum based 1% sales tax, which is the maximum rate allowed by statute. By law, the tax does not apply to vehicles, food, and drugs. 100% of this revenue source is deposited in the MIP fund to be used for projects. This revenue continues to outperform projections. The 2023 budget anticipates 2.1 million, which is equal to 2021 actuals. The 2023 year end projection is $600,000 above the 2022 budget and allows the village to set the annual transfer in the 2022 and 2023 back to the historic funding of 1.72 million. Um, the budget amount for state sales tax and non-home rule sales tax is based on anticipatory, anticipated possessionary driven decreases in the consumption of goods and services to which these taxes apply. Are there any questions on that? I got some totals here for you to see. So we are estimating to end 2022 at 3.92 million. Um, we budgeted 3.4. Um, our local use tax, we estimated um, 2022 to end at 679,000. The budget was 726,000. So as a net, the total um, estimate is 4.6, and we budgeted 4.1 in total. Are there any? I, just, I had one question. Sure. Did, did we, do we have the amount for uh, 2022 thus far that we are impacted uh, in relationship to the loss of the uh, oasis? I don't have that dollar amount with me. Um, however, I do know that um, with DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats, that helps take care of some of the food and beverage costs that were lost and some of the sales tax as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, in terms of, so, the businesses started peeling off with the final one closing in October of last year. Right. So this full year we've experienced without it and our estimate was just on um, this um, sales te tax component was around $250,000. As Allison said, the other areas have crept up higher to offset the, the um, not all of the losses. So our actual growth in these categories is less than if the Oasis was still in place. But we don't have an actual dollar. Um, right, because I think our total was around a half million dollars. Yes, in total. total. In yes. total, and yes. so the Delta is about $300,000 that. Right, because remember, um, the sales tax, and sales and use tax is one component, then there's the non-home rule sales tax, which mm -hmm. is applied. And then the places for eating tax was applied. So there's actually three buckets that funneled into just that middle piece of the oasis. Right, and that 300,000 will, will not be coming back. I mean, from what I understand. 
Well, we have, um, per the IGA, where um, we developed that property. Okay. We're currently in conversations with the tollway <clears throat> to identify an acceptable de development concept. Right. And the goal would be to replace the lost revenue and, in a perfect world, build on it. Right. Okay. Thanks, Kathleen. And we're still getting the gas station revenue from the Oasis. Correct. Correct. Yeah. There, there hasn't actually been a diminishment um, in the performance <coughs> of the gas. It's multivariable, right? So the gas prices have gone up. So you can't really back out the number. Right. We, we're not sophisticated enough here to back out the number to try and determine what the differential is. But, right, but we get an incremental benefit just because gas prices have, have exploded. So. Correct. And they're still, they're still shopping at the convenience store on either side. Right. Okay, the next one up is places for eating tax. Places for eating tax is a 1% tax on food and beverages collected locally by the village. Um, this revenue is negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, resulting in 2020 revenue being down 23% from 2019 pre-pandemic revenue. This revenue is meeting pre-pandemic levels, largely through the success of the outdoor dining program. Growth in this area has been less robust as it could have been due to the closure of the restaurants at the Oasis. Um, as I said before, some of the Oasis revenue loss is being made up by the addition of DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats. Next up is utility taxes. Um, utility taxes consists of a 5% tax on gross receipts for natural gas and water service, 6% gross receipts tax on telecommunication service, and a per kilowatt hour tax on electric service, which approximates 5%. 1.5% of the total rate on all of this is allocated to the MIP infrastructure fund to help with those projects. For 2023, receipts from the utility tax on electric are budgeted to decrease to reflect actual budget performance in 2022. When we were doing the 2022 budget, um, we, I mean, when we were coming through 2022, we saw that the electric utility tax was not performing to what we thought was going to. So we adjusted the 2023 budget to reflect that. Um, receipts from the utility tax and telephone service, as you know, are expected to decline. Um, by 16% in recognition of the multi-year trend. This revenue source has steadily declined since peaking in fiscal year 10, 2011 and 12. Decline in this revenue will likely continue as it is attributed to the transition from voice to text and from the use of landlines to internet-based communications. The tax rates for all four utility tax categories are at the statutory rate limits. Um, utility tax for the water consists of 5% tax on gross receipts for water purchases. For 2023, receipts from the utility tax on water are budgeted to remain flat. Um, despite the rate adjustments that have been made, this revenue source will always have some type of uncertainty due to the, this be a consumption based revenue. Um, Does this a uh, question? This these numbers include the new um, fixed fee that we added, correct? Correct. Um, that is, um, the fixed fee goes into the capital, the water sewer capital. So that's not used for, that's not part of the utility tax for the water. Okay, so that's not reflected in these revenue numbers? Not in, not in the water utility tax now. Gotcha, okay. Last but not least, our permits. Uh, permit revenues for 2023 are projected to decrease based on the recessionary pressure in the building and housing market. Um, as you see on the screen, this is a total for all permits, which is our, our electric permits, building permits, plumbing permits, um, Cook County food permits, and overweight permits. Um, we estimate that we'll end 2022. 1,567,000, just slightly below budget of 1,580,000. A few other notable revenues that we want to bring up. Um, pool revenues continue to meet or exceed pre-pandemic levels. A 2022 estimated actual reflects a 33% increase of $81,396 over budget and an increase of $95,772 
or 41% over 2019. Park and related revenues are still down from pre-pandemic levels, and if you, as you know, the village has approved a new parking rate structure that will be fully implemented in 2023. The last one is the village anticipates 700, approximately 700,000 in grant revenue to offset expenses related to funding the capital improvement program. The $2.4 million in ARPA funds are allocated to the MIP to offset the cost for the standpipe reconditioning project and the reconstruction of six streets. <coughs> Um, and with that, um, we staff just asks for directions from trustees and the Finance Commission on assumptions for the major revenues for the 2023 budget. Anybody have any questions as to how Chris and Adam and I came up with the numbers? Or I don't. Well, thank you. Um, what I, I should have said this at the beginning, what we're going to do is based on these decisions, we're going to continue to build the budget and um, that will be um, uh, reviewed by the board and finance commission members on November 15th in a similar um, type of meeting with the committee of the whole. Or, um, so I wanted to let you know that. I also wanted to mention the binders. We're doing something different this year. We're trying to combine it all. So that's why the title says budget and capital plan. So um, if you'd like to take your capital book back home with you to keep you, you can do so, but we ask that you leave it here so we can insert the budget and we'll, so I forgot about that. So um, <clears throat> based on your decisions on the uh, revenue, just to reiterate revenue CIP and MIP will dictate um, the budget that gets presented to you. Actually, uh, Kathleen, sorry, I did have one additional question. Uh, is there anything on the expense side uh, that um, would be impacted by the increase in interest rates? Is there anything that we have on the expense side that's dependent on interest rates or affected by interest rates? Uh, no. Okay. Our, our debt is all fixed rate, right? right. Yes. We have no floating our rate debt. debt. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, one one thing, just to jump ahead a little bit. That one. Since you brought that up, what um, what we did, and um, in terms of order, we're going to put this in first. We're going to maybe do this at the end, but kind of frames the rest of the conversation. So, um, based on approving theoretically the operating revenues, we put together here's the total operating revenues, um, and then the draft operating budget expenses. We don't have the full budget together. Some things are, we have to look at things a little bit to refine it. So we're estimating those expenses to be at 20 million. Um, these are the other financing sources. This, this form should look familiar. It's been in all the years. Um, and you see here's the $2 million increase in the transfer, reducing the MIP down to 1.7, and then funding next year's capital plan at 1.4. And, and it will end the year at 29.7 and but anyway um, I think there's something in here that this should be I thought it was 26 this afternoon but anyway we're going to be close to 25 percent um, and and <laughs> sorry we were fiddling with numbers earlier today and so wanted you all to know that we're, we make this change and this change still stick to our reserve balance. I'll say 25%. Okay. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So. So we're going to, going to be talking about the CIP. You have a five-year CIP. We're going to be focusing on 2023 um, because that's what we're asking for authority to move forward and build into the budget. As a reminder, the CIP is a planning document. How that comes about is all the departments go and evaluate 
the, their needs, put them into the plan. Uh, we vet them best that we can, and then we try to make it worth work within uh, the resources that we have to apply to it. Uh, it's unstated, but uh, we like to take every opportunity to apply for grant funds when possible. There are some expenses in um, the CIP that there may be opportunity with community partners uh, because the village isn't the only one getting the benefit out of the asset. And we certainly will have those types of dialogues before um, the year that it's in. And, and I'm speaking mostly to the outer years, uh, 2004, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, but it's, the CIP is where we put items that are $10,000 or more. Um, as we talked about just a little bit ago, we've reduced the transfer. Uh, one of the uh, clouds hanging over this budget is obviously a recession and what that might look like. So we and the staff are fully prepared that in the event that there was some kind of um, uh, decline in our revenues that we didn't predict, that we would be following the same pattern that we did in 2020 and 2021, where we would um, identify those critical programs and, and fund those and everything else we would hold uh, to make sure that uh, we because as a reminder, that transfer, as we discussed, of 1.4 is um, discretionary and it's unrestricted. So if we needed to hold it to fund um, the operations and to support poor performing revenues, then that's what we're going to do. And you've prepared this yes. handy colored chart that prioritizes all Cor the capital items. Correct. And that chart is a result of the department heads getting together and prioritizing the needs for the year. Um, so that is not driven by management, just to be clear, it's, it's driven by the staff o over there. I may tinker with it from time to time, full disclosure, but for, for the most part, it's a result of that. Um, so the uh, CIP before you is $12.5 million over five years, and you can see the allocation. I indicated it in my memo to you all. There, uh, the parks and rec and public services are the key drivers. In, in the CIP. Um, we prepared this summary sheet which shows you that for 2023 we're expecting $2.4 million of projects and we have identified $771,000 of other sources to assist in funding, in funding that. Um, we often talk about the CIP and I don't want to lose sight of that, but um, we plan for projects and for a whole host of reasons they don't happen. Right, and so that's always our concern about over committing resources uh, because then we're taking it away, obviously, from the general fund. So, in 2022, we had budgeted 2.5 million dollars, and we're only expecting to do 1.6 million dollars worth of projects. So, that sits in the capital reserve fund and just builds for the next year, but um, there, there's a lot of movement and reasons why we don't do things. Uh, this table just shows vehicles um, to understand uh, how many, um, what we own and what we're planning to replace for the upcoming year, with the bulk being in the fire, uh, in the police department. There is a, uh, a schedule that we typically follow, but due to supply chain issues <laughs> with the squad cars, we're running into a significant problem uh, with that. So, and we and every other municipality. This is the replacement schedule. It has nothing's changed. That's just in there for your information. And then when we get to um, the items of the CIP, again, we're focusing on 2023. It says Memorial Building Space Reconfiguration. It really should say uh, it, it, we're evaluating the mechanicals and the configuration. The mechanicals is the bigger driver of this. So um, for those of you that were at the board meeting a couple weeks ago, <laughs> yeah. So um, we have an aging, um, we have aging facilities, and this being one of them. Um, and uh, we approved the lease so that the food pantry would, move, would be moving to another location. As you may be aware, if you've been in the village hall during business hours, there are sometimes two, three, four people in very small offices. So one piece of it is to move everybody around a bit, and uh, we could. Uh, use some help in determining the best way to do that. But additionally, we need to look at the mechanicals in, in the building, and that's actually the key 
driver, and an extra benefit is how we allocate people. So um, we want to be making smart decisions, and when you look at the capital plan in the outer years, there's um, boilers and things like that, and before we're making million dollar investments, we want a, a picture of all of it and to know what we're doing. Similar to what we did a few years ago with the roof replacements for all of the facilities. It's the same concept. Um, boardroom technology upgrade. So um, if you notice, these screens are fuzzy and it's because the system is analog and the TVs are digital. So that is, um, that money is to be used uh, to upgrade the system. And, um, and then the ERP, these two components are to complete the ERP installation. We're, we are making significant headway. I think um, um, you might have seen if you follow E! News that we now have online payments for uh, water bills. And um, so that uh, is, is up and running. And we're working on the building and uh, the purchase so we sh we're hopeful to close that out next year. And um, personal computer replacement program, um, we did an evaluation and previously it had been funded at $30,000 and we increased it to $36,000. And look to Brad, because that's Brad's um, little area. Okay. Um, and under the EDC component, uh, we have the Robbins Park Historic District signs. Uh, one of the things that brings people to this community, obviously, is the historic nature of the downtown. So these are signs to put at the, at, at, um, identifying that. And then the other two items can be uh, taken together. This is um, a carryover from last year. We have grant monies to be used to improve the area from the parking deck up to the Chamber of Commerce and then bringing people to First Street. We didn't move forward on that had to do with timing and workload and the project on Garfield. It didn't seem to make sense to have that under construction with the alley at the same time. So we moved that forward to 2023. And then also uh, we have an opportunity to have grant funded the display boxes. It was pointed out if you go and look at the sad condition of the one on Washington, that we can improve our signage in the downtown as well to point people to First Street and. Um, and uh, the businesses in that area. So that is going to be grant funded. And then, um, so those are the $135,000 um, in EDC for next year. Kathleen, the, the historic signs, are, is that for the same signs that are already up, sort of the ones on the so street signs, or these are additional? These are those are different. The, these are meant to be like, you're entering this district. Okay, so it's something right. new than not yes. what we already have. Yes. It's not the little toppers. Okay, yeah. that's what I was wondering. That's but the toppers are great, aren't they? Yes. 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 Um, so um, that that's what that is for. And then um, and and of course in previous years we had additional yeah. pictures yeah. of everything in the page number and we thought we would just identify the page. So if anyone has any questions, just let us know. Okay. Then moving on, we're um, to the police department. Um, Range up updates, we are funding, we had an evaluation done of our range, we need to make some improvement. So there are $250,000, but you also, if you recall, we have grant monies identified in that same amount to fund that. That is uh, through a grant from, um, soon to be, <coughs> uh, from Speaker Welch's office. Um, and so uh, we're very happy that we were able to receive that grant. Um, Kathleen, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what is range updates? I'm not we have a gun range. Shooting range. There's a shooting okay. range in the basement of yeah, the police okay. station, and it's an asset so our people can train and uh, here okay. as okay. opposed yeah, to I just going. didn't, I didn't, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. No, nope, it's a good question. It's the, it's the kitchen for spending 250 on the Viking range. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a good shooting range for $250,000. <laughs> <laughs> the old one's in really bad shape. Yeah. Okay. Seriously. Yeah. It's been shot up. Yeah, the range, it, it, it's in need of some improvements. Correct, Chief King? Yeah, the, uh, unfortunately, it stopped. Uh, we had to take it offline because it uh, failed an air quality test. So we tried to work a couple times with the ventilation system, and uh, it needs a... So the biggest chunk of that grant money is actually going to the uh, air quality filter in that range. Uh, 
less so the cosmetic stuff. And then um, we're replacing a fingerprint identification system and purchasing some other equipment as well, some radios, and then you see um, the squads being replaced for a total of four hundred eighty-four thousand six hundred dollars. So, um, in public services, <coughs> we'll move along to there. Um, we're going to be replacing the oil storage tanks. The dump site improvements, that's a new item to the CIP. Um, this came out of also the, uh, the move from the food pantry down to the Humane Society. In the back of the public services area, there's a lot of spoils and debris. It's been that way forever. Um, we, because we will now be sharing use in that back area, uh, we feel that we should look at opportunities to improve the use in that area and, and identify different ways maybe to handle and manage that, that debris. So the $75,000 is to study, to identify what opportunities we have um, to address this. And um, in subsequent years, 2024 um, 20, and 2025, there's $500,000 in each year for potential improvements. Those are placeholders. Um, and no decision will be made on any dump site improvements until that report is done and then brought back to the board for did you want to say anything, Trustee Postma? Yeah, no, I, I talked to George about this a little bit um, this afternoon. And, um, you know, I, I know that um, George and his staff first started looking at this at the time when that uh, parking lot north of the HCS building was going to be expanded uh, northward. And, um, you know, I think now that the, the parking is a little bit different, we can probably look at some you know, alternatives, which are, um, you know, much less costly um, than than a million dollars. Um, Cause I, I, I know that what was sort of contemplated in the million dollar number was basically having a new entrance to the, the dump site from the north, which would require cutting into the hill, which, you know, as you might imagine is fairly costly and, you know, I guess, I'd like to see if it's possible to, you know, continue to access the site from the south as it is today, but perhaps having some enclosures to, you know, just from like a cosmetic perspective, but also just from, you know, containing the waste, you know, keep that all contained and, and out of view of, of, uh, of HCS and, and also just the community generally. That's correct. Okay. Hey. Thank you. So we'll, we'll be bringing that back to the board for your consideration um, at some point in the future. Um, we have replacement of some equipment, which is <coughs> the unit five, unit 19. Um, replace the street light poles and lamps. That is, has been increased from 12,500 in previous CIPs up to $25,000. Um, we also are replacing a um, uh, pre-treatment storage tank for the salt. And then the next two items are two new items to the CIP, um, and they will continue in perpetuity or, um, or until um, they're all resolved. But um, if you've walked in the downtown, um, the brick crosswalks have been a nice addition, um, but there's been some chipping of the bricks, and so we need to bring them up to what they looked like a few years ago. So we're allocating funds, 20,000 per year moving forward to do that. Um, then the Woodland Green Gardens, uh, we've uh, started to, we've observed, meaning the staff, um, that some of them may not be functioning the way that they should be functioning. And um, so this allocates funds for a certain amount of rain gardens to be done each year. Um, the, the green gardens properly functioning helps with the street and the overland flooding and things like that. So um, that's why that one was added to this. George, do you have anything to add? Um, just we've gotten some feedback from the residents in the woodlands about the green gardens and the general condition of them. Um, and we've seen significant erosion going on in some of the older ones, like in phase one. So 
John Fennell, our village arborist, went with his staff and raided all the rain gardens. So we have a plan put together where we'll be focusing on addressing the worst ones first um, and then building out from there. But some of them, there's a lot of plants that have died. There's been erosion where we're, some of the road has been exposed and curbed. So this kind of addresses some of those high priority rain gardens and then we would be doing seven per year. Um, the Highland train station, that's a carryover from last year. We're hoping for that to be grant funded and the Memorial Hall roof railing. We had received a request as part of our 150th celebration and to restore the roof railing um, that used to be at the top of this building. We can't afford to do that within our operating budget or make it part of our CIP. We have too many other competing demands. But if we're able to, through the 150th celebration, identify donations that want to be contributed to that cause and we raise enough money, then we'll go ahead and do it. Uh, Kat, uh, yeah. Sorry, Kevin, on, on the Highlands uh, train station, uh, is there any opportunity to, um, that, that, that building's pretty small uh, and it doesn't fit many people. Uh, and I know there's a section on the bottom, like on the ground, I don't no idea what's in there, but is there any opportunity to improve that bottom section have sort of more space for people if we're going to you know do work on that building in general are you, are you talking about the basement there the lower level yeah right at the parking lot level that was like there would be it would be a significant cost to upgrade that it's it's an old brick foundation and it's primarily used for storage right now but we have just completed an assessment of that building and we're going to be improvements to it in January, we could certainly talk to our architect about any opportunities there for usage of that space. Just if, if metro It's already a, yeah. if it's already a tight it. budget to begin with, and to how it would function would be, we'd have to really look at that. But we can Just explore the, it with Metro, because yeah, they're, they're, they're the ones that are funding it with the grant, and right. if they wanted it to be improved in such a manner, and they're willing to fund that, then we can look at that. It's worth asking. Okay. Um, and parks and recreation. Um, so you can see that, um, that we have $550,000 budgeted for this year and throughout the various years in the CIP. Um, this is one area that has gone up considerably. Um, and <clears throat> when you look at it, we're going to replace a truck for $55,000. We're going to replace some uh, playground equipment at one for $180,000 that was previously in the CIP for around $300,000. Tuck pointing, this is at the Montessori building, that's per the terms of the lease that we have that was originally, um, I think, $75,000, but that, that went up. A new item in um, the CIP is the KLM uh, park fence repair and replacement. It's in this year at $11,000, but it goes up to $55,000 for um, starting in 2024 and then on through 2027. It's it's the fence surrounding the park and we're getting complaints and there are problems with um, We also have a bleacher replacement and fence replacement at Pierce Park. Um, those are two new items as well. So we're adding $75,000 each year to the CIP for improvements at Pierce Park. Those two items, we are in a com we have engaged com um, the Little League about the improvements there. See if we have an opportunity to cost share with them. Um, Vec Park and Robbins Park, we have um, some soccer goals. Uh, Mike has shared with me that one of the soccer goals had duct tape around it, and I, I probably should replace <laughs> those. <laughs> um, and then um, we have flooring in uh, LM Lodge. That's at the entryway and the stairs and the main dining level. And we're doing improvements to the pool. Obviously, you heard we're, we're generating a lot of revenue. We want to make sure we maintain that asset. And then um, phase three study of, um, of the pool, for which uh, President Colley in his comments tonight will note that we have out there and we would like um, residents to provide feedback as to potential improvements. Um, and then we did have a conversation with Trustee Postuma today, just the overall parks and rec and a lot of the parks improvement. And that also, it's multifaceted. There are some uh, areas where there might be um, broken equipment that needs to be replaced. 
Um, additionally, in order to receive grants, um, you need to generally have some public input as to what is going to go there. Uh, we were fortunate when we received the Oslad grant for the pool that we had had some community dialogue so we could sub uh, provide that with our grant. So some of the uh, programming of the parks that you see from now through 2027 anticipates a community dialogue. We can check that box and then apply for the grant. Um, but we are going to um, exhaust grant opportunities before we move forward on them because each of them has been programmed at about um, some of it's just moving um, them between, I think if you, if you look at it, Dietz get, was moved up, Robbins was moved up, and then a new park in, in Cape. And so that was the thinking behind that. So um, do you have anything to add, Mike? No. Okay. And, and Kathleen uh, handed out uh, at the beginning of this meeting some analysis of uh, the additional parks and rec expenses over the uh, the next five years, and if you there's there's one chart here that kind of breaks it down by category, and then there's a uh, uh, as you can see, really the kind of the the big new items, shall we say, um, are KLM and Pierce, um, and so uh, that's where a lot of the new, <coughs> the new changes to the CIP are coming in. Yeah, for uh, for KLM. I know there's been, I think, feedback on the decor being dated and, um, you know, uh, I don't think we've done anything to sort of uh, change the decor there in a while. Um, before investing another 37000 to redo the flooring, like, would it make sense to leverage? We have great designers around in, in the local area that I think could do, you know, amazing job in that space. Would it make sense to have maybe like a, a, an overall new design and maybe not that you implement that right away but you actually have a plan for what it will look like and we start to build towards that like it would hate to put a new flooring in and you know uh then not look great you know and none of us are designers i'm sure so uh it's going to be hard to figure out what would look good and what would be pleasing to the potential customers so that would be my recommendation yeah absolutely and they'll, they'll be part of the plan of it too is bringing somebody in figuring out what the layout's gonna be. And I know we did budget for some general new furniture this year at KLM also, because it's a little outdated. Um, but our absolute end goal is to spruce up that environment and make sure that we're bringing in new clients and repeat clients. And you're absolutely right. We, we do need to look at that for the future. Just pull the gun right away. It's very historic right now. <laughs> yes, you can that do it tastefully and make it look, you know, still keep with the character, but refresh. Trustee Pastrana, this is uh, Panas here by uh, Waldo by phone. I know we're just a few minutes from the end of our allotted time. Yeah. Um, do we plan to continue the conversation of this at another meeting? Uh, I'm particularly, you know, wanting to spend a little time on slide 13, which is upcoming, where we sort of show the flow of funds for the next flows of funds for the next five years, and the drawdown of the reserve balance, and, and, and talk about how we potentially address that. Um, well, in the CIP, or do you mean? Yeah, I think I think no, in the in the CIP, sure. Yeah, <coughs> what I what sure I think the... what I think Adam is referring to is is the fact that again, if all the proposed expenses in the plan actually came to pass, when you get to twenty six oh. and twenty seven, you have a negative balance. Co correct, and last year we had a negative balance as well, um, and what I had stated earlier is this year we didn't spend 800 some odd thousand dollars uh, um, of projects and so we're planning for those things. We don't think we should be allocating funds out of the general fund now to fund those through, because so many things can change between now and 26 and 27. Additionally, as I said, that the, there's key drivers with the parks that are driving the expense of the overall CIP up. If we're able to obtain grants, then we then that um, offsets the um, the need to increase the transfer. Similarly, um, there are opportunities with energy efficiency grants which we haven't taken advantage of, and I'm assuming. The historic mechanicals in this building certainly might be eligible for something like that when we're talking about improvements. 
So that's why at this point in time, we're cognizant that uh, we're, we're at a deficit number in 26 and 27, but at this point, it wouldn't, um, I wouldn't advise moving additional money over. We, we really should be looking at the next three years and even with that, things move around quite a bit. Well, okay, but let me just uh, throw this out. I mean, we sort of, on a five-year smooth basis, we're, you know, we're having fun. We've identified funding on, on slide uh, 13 of about a million six a year, right? Mm -hmm. And we have kind of a run rate spend of two and a half million a year. And I know things move around from year to year, to be sure, and we've seen that over a long time. But that's a pretty wide gap, as, as big as I remember. And I guess the, the question I, I would pose is, do we really feel good that sort of taking our ongoing annual transfer amount up to $1.4 million from $1.25 million is going to allow us to manage through what, at least on the five-year smooth basis, seems like a lot larger uh, potential structural gap? I, I started looking at what you're talking about um, in terms of doing a 10-year history, and I'm not done with that quite yet. Um, but I, I would like to see what happens between this year and next year, and then we can look at this at what the outer years are. Um, we have items um, in there, a $730,000 engine, for example. If we were to receive a grant for that, I think that offsets, I, I don't have the number at the top of my head, but it's, it significantly reduces um, re reduces the deficit in, in the outer years. And so those are the types of things that, um, again, you're, when you move additional money from the general fund, then you're putting pressure on that. So if we increase at 1.4, we're hovering around the 25% reserve. So now we're dipping into our, um, we'd have to take from our operating budget to put money in for projects that may never happen or substantially reduced. And using the Burns Field Park example, we have 300, had $300,000 in it last, in for last, year. last year's estimate. We're, we're now, we now have it at $180,000. So that's a $120,000 swing that, again, has been taken, would have been taken from the general fund. So um, I, I know it may be a little unsettling to see those numbers, um, and, but at this point, because it is so uncertain at what's going to happen in those outer years, I don't think it's wise to change that number. Well, and Kathleen, you really, I think, you hit the point I thought you might, which is that, you know, with the reserve balance uh, preliminarily targeted to, to be in the 26% level based on very preliminary 23 sort of skeletal budget you all put together, um, there's not a lot of room to stay above that 25% uh, target reserve level and, you know, increase the transfer in above the million for you've identified annually for fiscal 23 through 27, right? So, um, so that, that sort of, um, and, and I, I, I pose a challenge, right? Well, it is a challenge and we let a, a f we went back and talked to the previous finance director and I couldn't remember, I think it was maybe 20, 16, 17, we increased the transfer from wherever it was a million up to a million to five. So on an annual basis, we will continue to look and see if we should increase that transfer. And additionally, just like we've done with the MIP or as if we have additional monies um, available at the end of the year, this will be part of our thought process if we continue to see um, the deficits in the outer years and really believe that it's going going to continue, but I, I really think we need to keep narrowing our focus down to because the ver it's so great. I mean, the numbers in the CIP, um, because of the inflationary pressure, really significantly increased, right? And um, we didn't know that two, three years ago. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I don't, I don't even know for, for 2024 and 2025 whether, you know, those numbers will end up being as high as they are. I mean, I'd, I'd like to dig into those numbers a little bit more. So, but I, I think what staff's trying to do is trying to identify, you know, all the possible things that they might spend money on so that when we get to those years, we're gonna have budgeted properly for that. But that doesn't mean necessarily that these are the actual numbers that we're gonna end up putting in our budgets, you know, 
two, three, four years from now. Right, and, and just as we said, would, those deficits could actually be larger if we wind up reducing the transfer because of some kind of uh, financial pressure that we had not anticipated. So it's a planning document. 2023 is the year that we're, that we're really, really focused on. So um, I know we're gonna, our meeting's gonna start shortly, um, the other one, but I think we can probably get through this rather quickly. So uh, the last page is there's $1.6 million in addition. Not much of it is, uh, is carryover uh, from the other projects um, that, that we've already talked about. And um, then the last, and if the board um, agrees and the Finance Commission members of the 2023 CIP, then we will build the budget that's presented in a week and a half with that assumed. We already have started, but we need confirmation before we bring it forward. And then the last piece, just at a very high level, and the reason we wanted to bring this forward was the up updated MIP. Um, and so uh, we put together a summary of the 2023 MIP revenues. We just wanted to touch on, because we're going to build the budget this, uh, this way as well, or we have been, is that um, we're going to be using a million dollars in the ARPA funds. So the bucket of money we received was 2.4. We're gonna divvy it up with 1 million going to the standpipe, which is planned for next year, and the remaining 1.4 to go to 6th Street, which is programmed for 2024. We have to spend the funds by 2024. These two purposes are within um, the requirements of the use of the ARPA funds, because there have been, the, there are certain conditions placed on the use of that money. And so we think that that's how we should spend it. Um, additionally, so what we did is we just took, at a very high level, uh, the funds available at the beginning of, the, of this year, you can see what that is. Recurring revenues, that's the non-home rule sales tax, that's the utility tax, that's some FFT, um, all funneled in there. Then other revenues, we've identified why it's so. It's um, 1.6 million dollars. We also have 235 thousand dollars in capital. If you recall, and it's on tonight's agenda, we have money from County to offset the cost of um, a, a drainage improvement, <clears throat> a couple drainage improvement projects, and that shows the total funds available. And then. Um, expenditures, which again are subject to approval later this evening or shortly. Uh, we're planning including the debt service for $8.4 million of spend in 2023. And these are all the projects that have been identified. And then here's a, one of our favorite pictures showing how much work you all have authorized to do to improve the village um, 2008. It's pretty phenomenal actually. Um, this is the work that was completed this year, the orange construction. I think you guys can identify Garfield. Um, and then these are the streets uh, planned to get approval for, for this year as part of the designing and engineering component. And then um, just restating that we plan to use a million dollars for standpipe and 1.4 for sixth. And then um, making those transfers um, and then including that reduction of the annual transfer from the Emma, uh, from the general fund at 1.7. And I just, I say reduction just over previous years, um, shows that at the end of this project, uh, we are still showing that we will have a fund balance of two and a half million dollars. So, and I think that, uh, so, that, that's a really good story and a really good job by um, the village board to identify these projects and do it in a methodical fashion and, and accomplish a lot of work. Uh, Matthew and George have been working with uh, at identifying um, and we, we're reviewing plans for the next MIP and that will be brought to the uh, board for, for their approval and that's for 20. Okay. So what we're asking now is the approval of the CIP only, the um, increase in this year's transfer to the CIP, establishing the 1.4 as the new transfer, and then also using the ARPA funds as we've identified. Pardon? They, they approve the revenue system. Yeah. 
So that's what we're asking for approval for. Does everyone agree do with you, do going you have a in that? Formal motion or no? Okay. No, because we're going to bring forward the. It'll be in the budget. It'll be a and component that, of the budget. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we got another look at it. Yes, you do. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you for everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you Chairman Waldo. Thanks for the staff for all their work on this. Yes. Yeah. And yes. Good, I, and I, excellent presentation. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. And I, I do have to thank all of the staff. They they do such a great job of getting this all together and giving a thoughtful review, and it's a lot of extra work to their day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. But this is the one to move to adjourn. Yeah, might as well. I'll right. put it all in the book. Well, I'll just put it here. I was going to take it home and memorize it. Move to adjourn. Are we adjourn? Move to adjourn? Yeah. That's what I did. Sorry. <laughs> move to adjourn. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 aye.